that was the story that I always wanted to be told and I didn't know I wanted it to be told. Oh, I love that. You know, that's my motto. That is my motto. My motto yeah. is bring people to places they didn't know they wanted to go. Hey everybody, my name is Tom Scott. This is TNP Daily. Today I have Julie Tamor. Julie, it's really great to see you. You know, I, I, there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about, but I want to start here because um, I watched you speak. I would imagine you felt this way. I, I know I do, which is you spoke at our first gathering. And so when I watch it, I cringe because I'm like, oh, my God, we used to do that and we did that. And how could we have not done this? And how could we have not done that? <laughs> <laughs> but your talk was beautiful. It really it was beautiful. Um, and all I could think about in watching the Glorias was. I wonder what Julie would say to Julie, the way Gloria got to speak to <laughs> Gloria. <laughs> and do you think about that? Do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is that I guess what you see in the glory is when you have the older Julianne Moore speaking to Alicia Vikander, quite often it's about go ahead and say what it is you want to say. Um, don't hold back, find your voice. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the whole, what, what those moments are. And then Gloria says, uh, Julianne Gloria says, uh, don't worry, you'll say what you'll 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 speak your mind plenty, and it'll get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I think that I am the reverse. I mean, I think that I did say I have said a lot, like in my movie career, definitely. I I mean, partly why it's been so held back is because I was very direct. I never had a problem with being direct or being honest about what I felt, um, and the times have changed. See, what, mm -hmm. what is interesting is, I don't know that I could give myself, my, my younger self any um, advice right now. I think as, as looking back to my experience, my experience as my younger self lets me know where to go now. I mean, reflecting on the past and reflecting on the things that, the troubles, the barriers, the difficult things, um, you just learn from it, but that's normal. That's not something special. You know, I don't, I don't know if I have that exact same conversation that Gloria has, has, you know, well, one of the themes in there is, um, is courage or that's what I take out of it is, you know, the, the, the more mature Gloria has courage and, and, you know, the younger, I think there's times where you see like a sophomoric courage perhaps when she's younger but there's also some timidness in the very beginning where she goes along maybe to get along just a little bit um Where probably less than... i think when she first gets to new york magazine she kind of goes along and yeah i don't think so you don't see it that way no i don't at all i see that the times were such that there was no choice I, I really think that she pushed it. Like when you're watching her with New York Magazine and she sits down on the desk and she says, I don't agree. And, you know, I think that this March on Washington is going to be huge and it's going to be important. And he just doesn't get it. So she has to find a way around when she says she's going to interview uh, James Baldwin and he's going to be at the march. And she goes out the door. I, I think that she managed to constantly, Gloria, without being aggressive, without being loud and noisy and bossy and all the cliches about women who are in power or liberated or whatever, I think she managed to, to do exactly what she needed to do to find, to, to, you know, to find her voice and then to make her voice heard. I think it, I, I, I read somewhere, you know, there's all, reviews are always all over the map. I mean, you either like this or like that. I don't like this. I hate Julie's this, or blah, 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 blah. So I, I kind of take it all at stride, but I, I sometimes find it very interesting to see, 
you know, when someone thinks that she has been timid or whatever, I, cause I, I, there was just one the other day that felt that it's not that this is what I take from Gloria Steinem's story is the greatest, most powerful, um, character, uh, specialty or what really makes her extraordinary and where she has gained her power is in her ability to be quiet and listen is in her mm -hmm. ability to take in which is the opposite of a kind of trumpian loud mouth i'm the best i can save i can do this patriarchal approach to leadership that gloria learned when she followed in india that woman to the villages and sat in those talking circles in the Gandhi style that, of course, the older woman says, we women taught Gandhi everything he knows. And I bet that's true. But the women never got the credit. You know, they never did yeah. because they didn't go, look at me. It's me. Right. It's about me. And I would find that that aspect of Gloria was there from the very beginning. I mean, she had um, courage and... and uh, you know, we have this one word, ballsiness, which is, you know, think about it. It's like a pathetic word because it only goes for one gender, seriously. Um, we don't even have it in our language for a woman who basically goes to a very uncomfortable or very unsafe zone, what we would call unsafe, and experiences life. Gloria did that from the time she was a little girl, from the time she went to the barber shop with a stranger and crossed over the racial lines and became friends with this little girl and, and tap danced over there. I mean, this is, and took care of her mother at age 11, you know, never went to yeah. school. It's, I, I, I think that we're so used to the leadership coming in the form of, of um, standing out, you know, of being loud. And that is not Gloria Stein and strength. It's not that she isn't a good speaker, she is. Is she the greatest? Maybe not because that's never what she ever really thought of herself as, you know, an orator or that, but she is, I mean, she's yeah. very good and inspiring and it, that takes a long time. So anyway, that's that, I, I don't really see her as having any timidity as a young, I find it sensitivity, not timidity. And I think when she walks out of that New York Times editor's office, when he makes a pass at her, it's not a great, it, it's exactly the way it could be and would be during that time. There's nothing wrong with that guy. See, I, I'm of that age where he was normal. He really respected her. This is what's interesting. She's a single mm. woman, young single woman in her late 20s. She's fair game. That he would be having an affair, maybe that's the part that's bad. But making a pass at someone who is a, is a freelance writer for you, it's not cool today at all. But the guy really appreciated her. He saw her intelligence. He gave her a shot even though it was writing silly articles that she could care less about. He, he was doing something that nobody else was doing. You know, I mean, girls did the research, men do the writing. So I tried in, in this movie to make the men very much a product of their times and not two dimensional monsters. I just don't feel that about it. I feel like people are what the times allow. I know a lot of these guys have been me too, a lot of them. And they're as shocked, you know, it, it, some of them are worse. Some of them deserve what they got, like Harvey and all of that. Yeah, I, Frida, so I know Harvey. But, um, but other ones, it, it's cultural. And the culture has changed for the best, for the better. You know, I was thinking about, well, first of all, let me say, I think the fear that I felt was mine. Because oh. I know I felt fear. And I think I felt my fear as I reflect on it. I felt my I'm an appeaser, I, especially as a young person. I was an appeaser. I went along, you know. I, I didn't want to, like, upset the, the professionals, the grown-ups. And so I felt a fear when she was in that. You know, I'm sort of expecting, well, she's not going to like this. And then I feel that moment of, like, oh, gosh, she's, she's sort of being put upon in some way. And then I think my fear. Because here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You don't know this, and don't, don't let this creep you out. But I think about you a lot. Because I really respect a lot of what you do, and you, you, we don't know each other that well, but you and I sat next to each other when I was in hell for dinner, and you were in hell. You were in hell with Spider-Man, and I was in hell with some shit lawsuit you can't imagine. And you and I were talking. And so that, I go back to that moment. It was a decade ago, and I go back to that moment, and I think about it a lot. But I also think about my mother. Okay, my mother is just old enough 
I'm sorry, just young enough to be Gloria Steinem and too old to be Gloria Steinem. And she and it hurts her to this day. I used to go to the women's rallies with her. I went to her friend's house and while the husband was at work, helped her move out of the house so that when he got home, she was gone. My mom was like a feminist and she was June Cleaver all at the same time. And it, and it hurt her. She's 81, 81. And it hurts her. And to this day, it hurts her. And she feels a pain and a frustration with her life. And I saw that in Gloria's mom. And I saw that in Gloria. Yeah. I mean, Gloria's mom is like my mom. That's that's mom. I'm, if you if you listen to this, you, you didn't have you don't have some of the mental challenges, but she has some challenges related to these issues. But if she wasn't fulfilled, which is what Gloria's mom was, she never actually yeah. fulfilled any of her her talent or her ideals about what she wanted to do in life. And she just acquiesced to this marvelous comic and pathetic and irresponsible husband you know? yeah. all at once. I mean, she did love something in him when they got married. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Gloria seemed to love her. You know, it's funny. It sort of reminded me of Frida and her dad. Gloria loved her dad. Yeah. A lot, yeah. a lot. Yeah. Even though she, she, she had to grow to understand what the dad had done, uh, not maliciously, but had done to the mother you know right well and then the other one is you i mean i can't i mean i'm i'm gonna guess i'm not the first person to say this but when i watch frida i think about you when i watch um the glorias i think about you when i think like i do is that normal do you hear that <laughs> no what do you think what do you think well i okay okay so let's start with frida I'm not frida i'm not anything like frida Okay, but let me, okay, so I'll tell you my thought process and why I think that. Well, first of all, Frida has a courage. You know, Frida was sort of born with some kind of a courage that I don't think I have. Uh, by the way, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm one of those idiots who relates it all to me too, right? And so I was going to be a certain kind of person. I was going to be an athlete. I was going to work hard. I was going to be a masculine person raised in a family where my father was a Marine. And years later, I discovered sort of creativity and other things that I am truly passionate about. But I really didn't get to it until later in life because I didn't have the courage to be in the play when I was in seventh grade. It's as simple as that. Against who? Against my friends, against all that. Frida, man, she's right in it from the get. And, and you, from, the, as from a young child, you were expressing. So that, there's one. I, I, I see those similarities. And then there's talent. You know, there's talent. And then there's, um, I think there's also, I mean, you, you talked about it. Like, I don't see you out chasing the Oscars left and right. I see you expressing yourself, um, what's the right word, organically. And I think that's what I see in Frida. Like she sort of patiently speaks through her art form. I could keep going, but I, so I see you in her. Well, you know, it's, these are the two biopics I did. They're about, about real strong individualist women. Um, Frida, when Frida's a love story, seriously though. Frida really is a love story. And she went yeah. through not just bodily pain with the accident and, and her whole life being in physical pain, but but the love for Diego drove her. I mean, that really was the center of her attention. You can see it in the paintings. And she never really thought she was a great painter. It, 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 from what I understood. Now, Gloria, I know. So I'm doing a bio, a bio of Gloria Steinem and I'm with her all the way. I, know, I read her book. I know her. I knew her before. She's executive produced. She's in it. She loves it. She answered any questions I had. So I feel like there's a true, true honesty. That doesn't mean every single thing happened exactly the way it's in a film. That just doesn't work in, in a work of you know, drama or theater, because you, you have to compress things. But she said, I don't know how you did that. I don't know how you got India to be so right, because I went to India. And I went to India, but I really went to Indonesia, because 20 years, I'm 20 years younger than Gloria, but I followed certain things in my path that she did. I went out at a very young age, from, from my suburb to Boston, to South Boston, to Roxbury, and worked with kids from, you know, the projects. And so I always was going out of what we call a comfort zone. That was comfortable for me to go out of my comfort zone, to cross those boundaries, whether it was to Indonesia, Japan, South America, I mean, uh, Mexico, Latin America. I'm more comfortable in a way than in my own. I can't understand our culture. I, I, 
you know, I, I see the Oscars going back to that thing as just, I've gotten so many awards that, that, you know, it's nice and they, there's a place, but it's not about that. It's about being free to do the work. You know, if, if it's a ticket and gives me, uh, uh, gives other people comfort, those awards that they'll give me the money and uh, opportunities to do some of these crazy projects I have. That's what I see in it. I see the opportunity to do more of the kinds of things I want to do because that's not happening and has not happened in the way that I wish it would. It doesn't. Not happening for you or in the world? For me, for me, for me, meaning I have seven projects that I want to produce for years and I have a very hard time getting them produced. Even the glorious was not raised, the money was not raised in Hollywood. Did you, did you hear that story? No. Well, I had Gloria Steinem's bestseller book, This Time, we, meaning the time where women's voices are finally starting to be heard. You know, the, the, the flip in the Congress is really, as you saw in the movie, is a result of what Hillary Clinton's loss was. As Gloria says in the article she wrote the day after the election, that it will be a relay race with women. It won't be a straight shoot to the top, uh, breaking the glass ceiling or whatever. Um, so I went, I had Julianne Moore attached to the project, myself and Gloria Stein, and went to Hollywood, quote unquote, and could not get more than enough money that would be a nice domestic you know, drama, a nice chick flick, in other words. They did not see the scope. It's 80 years of a woman's life, a hero, a living hero, and an era which is the second wave of feminism that has never been told in dramatic form, ever, in a movie form. Um, and, uh, you know, it was all under 10 million, basically, around that. Now, uh, you can make a lot of movies for 10 million. You can't make this movie. You can't make a movie that spans eight eight decades and goes to India and travels all over and lots of visual effects and 110 speaking roles. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just nonsense and, and rather offensive, I have to say, because I've seen so many biopics of Winston Churchill and LBJ and, and even Martin Luther King. I mean, I've seen a lot on Martin Luther King and, uh, and yet we don't have one on a living American woman who can really, it's her life, but it's also Flo Kennedy, Bella Abzug, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, you know, Hilma Mankiller, Dolores Huerta. It's very important to me that the other extraordinary women were also a part of this story. So we got the money not for profit. Gloria took us to this philanthropist couple whose names are not exposed because they don't make movies and they don't want to, but they give money to women's causes all over mm -hmm. the world. And they loved Gloria, they liked the script, they liked my work, and they said, we'll, we'll fund it. So we have a big movie, not for profit. That's probably never, ever been wow. done. So I, I have to say that. that I'm ashamed to say that I couldn't get the money. Um, and I have other beautiful projects and people say, oh, I love your work, I wanna do. But I don't, you know, I get offered things. It's not that, it's not like I'm looking for work. It's not, that's not the thing. It's just when you make a film or a theater piece or an opera, it takes minimum two years of your time. So I have to really, when I read a script, I have to go two years. Okay, do I want to be with this material for two years? And I say, mostly, no. I mean, Frida wasn't my project, but I, I looked at it. I met Salma. I thought she was unbelievable. And I said, okay, I'll be the midwife to her project. Then it became my project. Then once I immerse myself, I am gone, you know? You know, I go back to um, the story you told. I believe it was Bali. And you were, got the opportunity to observe a group of men come out and they had the mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adornment. Yeah, yeah experience, yeah. And, and that the, effectively they, they made this beautiful performance for nobody. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And my takeaway, and I don't know if you said this or not, was that they were doing it for some version of God. Now, yes, no, that's exactly what I. You, you're, you're with that, okay? It's spiritual. and there was. Say it again. It was spiritual. It was spiritual. It was for spiritual purpose. It was um, something greater than human beings, and and our. You know, our necessity to have kudos and money and applause. So within that, it's right or wrong. I thought, I think 
that's at the core of Julie's work. Is that fair? Well, I, I would be honored. I mean, honored is silly. I would be, what's the word? I, look, I do think that there is part of me that does it because I have to and because I'm able to, you know, because I can and because I, I cannot. I can't not. Do I want um, affirmation and, you know, the, the yes, I do. I, I produce things for people, groups of people. So this is very hard it's both great and hard to have a movie streaming when I'm, you know, not having any, any contact with anybody who's seen this movie. Now I'm having contact with you, but we showed this film, the glorious to a thousand people on opening night at Sundance in January. We premiered there and people were laughing and, you know, plotting and, and standing ovations and then the response and the adulation and the blah, blah, blah. And we do the Q and A and, you know, all that stuff. And then we did it one more time. I mean, it played a couple of times there and one more time for the makers conference, the women's makers conference in LA for about four or 500 women. And the same thing happened and that's it. Now, I don't know who's seeing it, except if they tell me, and I don't know that many people seriously. And, you know, it's there out there, hopefully connecting with people. And otherwise I wouldn't have made it. I didn't really make the Glorias not to have people really be transported, moved, open to something they'd never thought about, never experienced, sharing it, especially the men. The men in my life who have called or told me or I work with on it, their response has been even more interesting to me, exciting than, than what I would have expected from women. You know what I mean? How so? Uh, what, what excites them about it? The men that, I, that I've gotten response from, like my sound designer, when he saw it, you know, before he's working on it, he was just weeping. He said, or, or when it was all put together, that he, I think it's partly, I don't think he could express it. He, he might have had a daughter. I know a lot of them would like to see it with their children, with their daughters in particular, experience it with their daughters. But, but I think it also had to be, we don't really have movies about women that aren't comedies, you know, that are about women buddies that really aren't comedies. You know, the pretty girl with the, the pretty smart police officer with her fat sidekick type. We, we have those, those, those things, but we don't have serious um, films about women that are fun and entertaining, but that don't need men that don't revolve around a boyfriend a husband, an ex, a romance, a rape, uh, this or that, you know, it's, mo or women trying to be men. Like I would say the women empowerment films that really have turned me off lately are all these ones where women are kicking ass like guys. Like who gives a fuck? I mean, seriously. And especially when they're beautiful and they're in bikini underwear, that's the latest, you know, it's like, <sighs> You know, even even Wonder Woman, woman. I'm I'm looking at all these women on this island and going, why are they wearing Maybelline? You know, what the hell? Why are men all rough and scrub, but the women still have to have you know their hair blow dried and their makeup and their outfits? I that's that to me is as bad as it gets. It's not, you know, and and oh, they can use a weapon. <laughs> really? I mean, sure they can use a weapon, but that doesn't make them. That's not empowerment. That's just copycat. You know, that's something else that just maybe it makes young women feel good and they'll, I'll get a lot of backlash for this. But I, I just don't think people can appreciate women's power, the real power that women have, because they don't think it has enough energy, testosterone. Believe me, I, I'm, I'm going through things that obviously I heard when people read the script or wonder, you know, what's going to make your blood boil you know where's the violence where's the because look at the movies that we see they're about murders they're about detectives they're about you know i like fauda i love fauda i get it there's a place for that i'm trying to watch tehran right now it doesn't compare to fauda but it's a leading lady it's very nice but where's the depth of the story i don't get it you know just because oh when you know it's so i i um i do need to connect to people and have them be affected by what I've done, good or bad, because that's what I am, an entertainer at the bottom. Do I need to go out there and have people cheering at me? Not necessarily. Do I need any more 
awards or things? No, but I do need, I do would like, I don't need it. I can just die tomorrow and I'm in a beautiful place, but well, I love my dog. I love Elliot, you know, but what I, what I would like is to be able to, to actually make the things that I have in my mind and at my fingertips because I think people will enjoy them and get something out of them. That, I do have that belief in myself. Well, what I can't help but think is, um, I don't want to talk too much about this because it'll I'll just confuse even more, but suffice it to say I had a version of a white light experience, okay? White light? White light. You mean light bulb? Like, yeah, mystical, light. mystical, truly mystical. And someday I'll tell you about it if you want to know about it. But in this experience, I had this observation of what I would call the mother of the universe or an observation of feminine energy. And, you know, you were using the word power. And, and this is really like a visual observation of love told through a vision I had that was pretty outrageous. And um, I'm a totally different person from it. Now, as I was listening to you speak, and actually it's in, it, it's in Gloria. Some of it is in Gloria. Some of the language that I heard is in Gloria. Um, you know, I think it's the job of certain people to communicate these truths in a way that they land. I mean, too often these truths are communicated through frustration and they don't land. So people express their frustration but the beauty of the opportunity is missed, it's lost. So when I hear you speak, I think you're already doing that. And, and part of what I saw in this vision was that people like you are going to do that. This is your role. This is the way it works. And, and with, with passing moments, one, there's opportunities for people to create things that never existed. But as importantly is there's opportunities for people to observe things they couldn't observe before. You know, now all of a sudden they can observe these things and the irony of our times is that I think information overload has actually given us a gift of clarity when offered it. Now, unfortunately, they don't get offered it that often, but I don't think we're too far away from a place where people really appreciate beauty because they've been missing it for so long and they've been lost for so long and they're going to feel it when it comes about. I just said a lot, but I, but I want to relate it to, um, I love that, um, you know, for whatever reason, you chose to include this thing from Gloria's book, which is part of what you're talking about. I'm going to read it if it's OK. So taking to the road, by which I mean letting the road take you, changed who I thought I was. The road is messy in the way that real life is messy. It leads us out of denial and into reality, out of theory and into practice, out of caution and into action, out of statistics and into stories, in short, out of our heads and into our hearts. When I heard her read that, I thought, uh, I. I I hear you. I do connect with Gloria. We have, when I came up with this idea of the Gloria speaking to each other, she, she was just shocked. She said, because I only read that book. I didn't read her other books at the time. And she said, how did you know? How did you know that I do that? That I see myself on street corners or across the room, my younger self, and then I constantly have conversations. I definitely do know that, that those kinds of connections between people can happen. That whatever that is. I don't know what the word is, telepath. I don't know what that word is. But I come up with many of my most extreme ideas, not because I'm working hard at it. They just come. They come. They come sometimes. They come when I'm just about to wake up. You know, I just wait. I wait for it. It's, I let it like this thing that I'm doing right now, which this one I can't tell you about. I started in Korea many years ago. And and it's been ruminating for years and years. It's even outtakes from Lion King, from Spider-Man, from my life in Asia. It's very Asian, it's very Pan-Asian. It's extremely, it, it, you know, I'm gonna try and do it there. I started it there and I wanna, I probably wanna do it there because I think our culture, there's something that's just, um, people have lost their way on why they're producing and what they're producing. I feel like, uh, there's just too much. You, the overload, I would agree with. The clarity, I would not agree with. I don't think there's clarity. I don't think people know why they're emotionally hit or what they want. I, when they get it, they might feel it, but they don't have a clue as to what it is, especially the makers, the people who are putting out the stuff or paying for the stuff or buying it. There's just a lack of, of uh, caring, seriously, caring about 
is this going to at all enhance someone's life or culture? I mean, I, I guess the things that meant most to me in my life, and I probably spoke about it at an Nantucket thing a while ago, but for instance, when I was in Australia doing The Lion King, I, Frida, I think Frida had just opened that year, and I met somebody there who had just seen the movie Frida and came up to me and said, I just want you to know that I'm dying of cancer. And I saw your film and watching how Frida lived through pain completely changed how I'm thinking about my life right now. And that is why I do what I do more than anything. Because if we go back, and I, I'm sure I talked about this at Nantucket, but the origin of all of us makers like this is the shaman. And that's the shaman's role is to take people through the darkest, um, most difficult times in their lives. The Lion King is the biggest live event of any kind ever. There's an even better thing to brag about if I were a male. <laughs> go ahead. We aren't notoriously supposed to, to do that. But no, it's the most successful entertainment, including films, including any entertainment in the history of the world. Yeah. Beyond yeah. Star Wars and Avatar and Star Trek and everything. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's interesting because it's still going on. I mean, Lion King is still is performing in Japan right now. Every, every other country is closed down for COVID. But, but I don't think that there's an idea that it's over. I think it's just waiting to come back. But it's one of those things that trans, you know, it's able to speak equally in every culture. I've done the Chinese, the Brazilian, the Spanish, the South African, the Japanese, you know, and in their own languages. I loved the Chinese company. That was amazing. And it was just sad that they put it into the new Disney land in Shanghai, outside of Shanghai, because it needed to be in a theater on its own. You don't can't spend a day going on rides and then take your kids to a two and a half hour musical at the end of uh you know, all that popcorn and sweet stuff. So it didn't, it was there two years, I think, but, but it, it's, it was amazing company to see it, you know, really. And I put a new character in, I, I made monkey part of the Chinese Lion King. I thought, well, oh, we're missing really? monkeys. So the you, have you done that in other places? No, I just did it in China because I was well aware of monkey being like their most favorite character. And there are monkeys in Africa, but you know, and there wasn't a monkey. There was a baboon in the Lion King, Rafiki, but now there was a trickster monkey that was half, I designed the costume and, the, and it had picking opera kind of type mask, face makeup, and was sort of an African Chinese costume design. <laughs> Before we go off this clarity thing, um, I wanna clarify. <laughs> so, that I, so that I'm sure we're actually agreeing on the same thing. And so I'm going to say it one more time, and then you might tell me I'm wrong again, um, which is fine. So part of my thesis is that while I fully agree with what you're saying about the powers that be who make the selections and distribute the, the stories generally, I agree, totally agree with you there. What I'm saying is something a little bit different, which is that we people who I think in the end it's sort of a Joseph Campbell existence and that we thrive on certain fundamental, beautiful things, that we are so starved of it, blissfully unaware, or maybe not blissfully unaware, depressedly unaware of our scatterbrainedness and our loss of meaning and connection, that when the right story emerges, and maybe it's a set of stories, um, it's going to be like a magnet, and that people are going to, it will in the end be story, because I, you know, I look at the internet and social media and all these things and like, you know, I think people imagine that someone's gonna turn the switch off and, or stop the dopamine hits. I just don't think that's gonna happen. I think it's gonna require a change within us. And that change is gonna come in the form of a metaphor. Some metaphor or set of metaphors are going to change or are going to enlighten us to a truth. And I feel like we're getting to that place. That's, that's more my theory. When, I don't know. What exactly is it? I wish I knew. Um, I mean, what is the event or, or yeah, or the story. And I think there's a, well, I think there's a decent analogy to think of the fact that I think it's ironic that Disney was your partner on the Lion King. Cause that's a beautiful story. 
I just, I remember the first thing I thought was Disney's on Broadway. Like, eh, I don't want to go to that. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. Yeah, but the, you know, they've done that in the movies for years, whether you like their style or not. Bambi has a, has a very good message. And I think, I mean, I, re I only remember being depressed because Bambi died and I'm looking at deer here all the time. Um, but I think that, that Pinocchio and a lot of their stories are classic, great myths or stories. You know, they use them. Whether you like the manner in which they're presented is a whole nother thing. The kind of airbrushed style, the big eyes, all of that. And do they let the real edgy stuff, like in Pinocchio is one of the, the real Pinocchio is extremely dark. And it was beloved. But, you know, they may shy away from that in their contemporary movies because we have so much censorship in this country. Do you know that The Glorious has an R rating? And for what? I can't even, what, what might it be for? Three fucks, the word. And maybe because there is one second of a Screw Magazine cover art of Gloria. Yeah. And that's it. And yet kids can watch the kind of violence and horror and hatred and racism and ugliness of Trump and all of that. And people don't think that should be NC-17, you know, like turn the TV off. You're not allowed to see this obscenity. So I know that 10 year olds have seen the Glorias and have loved it. And it's for them. It's for boys at age 10 and girls. My kids in the movie are six and 12. So maybe it's that sort of, it's a minor thing, but it, it makes me where are your priorities? I mean, what do you really think is hurtful to, to, to human psyche? Because that's what we're talking about is this kind of, you know, the fact that, that I don't do social media. I don't have any of it. I don't have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I never have. Neither is Elliot, the composer, you know. Um, I'm, I, it's too distracting, you know. I didn't answer your question about the men in the Glorias, and, and, and I wanted to finish it and just say that men rarely get to go into the woman's room. You know what I mean? Like when these women are all together working on this magazine or at the women's conference and there are very few men there. I think for these men that I know, maybe you too, it was very exciting to see women enjoy working together and being smart and having a cause and being functional and actually being excellent at what they do. This is just not something that we see very much in stories, you know? Yeah. It's just all about competition. It's girl fighting girl, it's mean girls. Even Mrs. America was that. It was not honest. Um, and, and yet, you know, it came out before the glorious. So people think, well, that's, the, I already saw it. That's the story of the second wave. No, 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 no. Even Gloria wrote a huge article about it, that it, was a, it had a lot of falsehoods in it. Not that the actors weren't okay. It's just, it wasn't truthful. It was a classic, ooh, let's show the women in competition for who's going to get their book out, which woman is going to be on the front. Remember in, in the Gloria's, Gloria says, I won't be on the cover of Newsweek. Well, you have to be, her editor says, otherwise they won't do the article. She says, I don't care. A movement is about people moving, not one woman, not one white woman, she says. Back then, not one white woman. No, I won't. And then, of course, a photographer does, you know, at one of these rallies, does a te telephoto and puts her on the cover and she goes like this. Because she knows that that's going to make people think, well, who does she think she is? Who does she think she is? And, and that's what too many movies play women against and TV shows women against each other. And I, I'm, I'm kind of tired of it. I mean, I, yeah. I know it's out there. Of course there is, you know? I mean, I'm not happy about the lady who's going to be the next Supreme Court judge. You know, it's like, there's rotten women out everywhere. And she's rotten because she's not going to be an honest judge. She's, she's got her... You know, she's not going to really listen. You can't tell. I can't. I mean, I'm just on a tirade about this. But how can you people say free Michigan and free us? And we don't want to wear a mask when you know that this is about saving somebody else. And if you're pro-life, why aren't you wearing a mask? You know, you just go into the whole thing of it. You know, it's just political. It's just a game. It has nothing to do with people thinking about pro-life and ba unborn babies. Otherwise, there wouldn't be people saying, put that man, lynch him put them in the electric chair, go off and fight that war. You know, the amount of deaths and this and that. And this thing about being able to tell women what to do with their bodies, to nationalize the women's bodies and tell them what they should do and what kind of life, the rent you want to be pro-life, then don't tell a woman how she's supposed to spend 
the rest of her life because that's what life is. Life is how you spend it. And if you are going to make women have those children, then you take care of the children, government. You take them, you bring them up because that woman didn't want to do that. And her husband or her boyfriend isn't helping. Or you make laws where the woman carries for nine months and then the man has to take care for the next nine months. She just is able to go off and take a vacation having carried that. You know what I mean? I'm just being silly right now, but yeah. the, the, it, it just unnerves me with, the, with what's going on. Anyway, I went segueing off to um, Amy Coney, whatever her name is. <laughs> well, but it actually applies in the sense that, um, you know, for me, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm identifying with some of what you, you have heard from men. Like that was the story that I always wanted to be told and I didn't know I wanted it to be told. Oh, I love that. You know, that's my motto. That is my motto. Wow. My motto uh, is bring places, bring people to places they didn't know they wanted to go. That is yeah. exactly my motto. That's why it's hard because everybody wants to know, well, what's it like? What's it like? You know, what, what you're doing is there, can you, can you tell me what's it like? So you just have to trust me. You know, people, when I, when I was in with the Gloria saying, I'm going to have four Glorias on a bus and it's a bus out of time. And there's nobody who said, oh, I get it. Except for maybe my longtime producer, Lynn, because she knows me. And, and Gloria, who said, you got me. You got me. That's right. That was right. What you just, that ideograph of the bus, the Greyhound bus that is forever traveling in black and white on that endless highway with the yellow slash. You got it. That's the ideograph of, of my life. And, uh, but mostly it's ridiculous because people want to see something they've already seen, but they really don't. That's what the people who are scared say. Then they get all frightened and then you just don't get to do it. You know, sometimes I do, you know, across the universe, I got to make it and then it wasn't released properly. And why do you think that is? What, what's the difference there? Because I was going to speculate and say, well, maybe among the reasons that you struggle to get made some of the things you want to get made is because of what because of that phenomenon you just described and that person sitting in the room is in that class of someone doesn't know they want to know this well they don't want to know it anyway i mean they're worried about losing their job the people who have right. power right. they're just worried that they're going to make a mistake because they can't say well it was supposed to be like you know avatar or whatever you know it was supposed to be like that da, da, da. it's because they think that they have the knowledge of what people want. So let's make across the universe for 15 year old girls at the expense of the intelligence for the adults who went through the experience in the 1960s. You know, I'm, I don't believe in that kind of, this is for teenage boys, this is for old ladies, this is for, I don't make work like that. And Shakespeare was my model. And you know, the, in the plays I saw in Indonesia were my model where you, you um, the brothers Quay, the animators, uh, I forgot which one of the brothers said this, but I'm not going to take credit for it, but I think it's genius. He said, you create a work of art and it's like a building with 16 floors and you're taking the elevator up and you let your audience get off on any floor. They choose what floor they want to get off. Well, that's what Shakespeare is. You have Shakespeare doing incredible historic his, history plays. And there are the clowns who, you know, who take over, you know, whether it's Hamlet and the, the, the grave diggers, or you can have a serious discussion in Midsummer Night's Dream about um, abuse of power, about divorce, about climate change. And then you have the clowns who are, you know, who are the building the theater. I mean, he, there are all these types. So his audiences, Shakespeare's audience, was for the groundlings because they love the violence, Titus. Oh, most violent thing you've ever seen. They love the love stories. They love the clowning and the bawdiness of Faust, uh, Falstaff, any of it. And yet you can also play it for the poets, the philosophers, the queens, the kings, the psychologists. So everybody can go to a Shakespeare play and hook in at any level. That's the way I feel. I, I, that is what I aspire to that you, you, not every piece is the same. Not every play or every movie is for children or for you know, all ages, but there have been a lot. And Across the Universe was one of those, that it was a very wide spectrum. Grandparents, parents, 
children, they could all bring, their, they could all go to that together and say, wow, you lived through the Vietnam War, you were marching in an anti-war march, um, you know, was your life like that? You know, it, it had that, but the studio was not feeling secure because a movie like Across the Universe had not been made. Now you, then you got Glee. I mean, I'm watching spinoffs. Then you got all the other musicals. And I have been told, even Lin-Manuel told me at Sundance that he watches Across the Universe a lot as he's editing in the Heights. And the guys who did the Elton John musical and did the Queen, they all have, have told me how much it meant to them. So that's great. Maybe, maybe a lot of my work is just slightly ahead, like having Helen Mirren play Prospera, do you know the shit that I got for making that part a female? I'd already done it twice or three times in the theater with a male playing Prospero, and that works too. But this really works with a woman if you have your eyes wide open and your heart wide open. It works better. Now, now having done it both ways, the story becomes more enriched. Shakespeare couldn't make that part a woman, but it was a witch. It's about a sorcerer. So if you think about the times, Women were the ones that were burned alive at the stake, mostly more than men, or sent off, you know, or put into exile. So there's many things that come when you switch it. Now, everybody's doing women playing male roles in Shakespeare. But back then you had Vanessa Redgrave playing, wanting to play this part, but not, or, or there was a couple of others playing Lear, but not as a woman, not a female Lear, as a woman playing Lear, but it's a male Lear. Do you understand the distinction? Mm -hmm. Prospera was a woman, not Helen Mirren playing a male role. It was completely rewritten as a female role and it worked very well. So I've, I've, had, I've had the difficulties. I'd never, never not do what I have already done, meaning I'm glad I did it, but they weren't all appreciated at the time that they happened in the way that I wish they had been by, you know, people in power, people with money. <laughs> Well, first, let me ask a question before I say that. When you're doing Shakespeare, so, you know, among other things on film, you did Titus, The Tempest, Midsummer Night's Dream, right? I could imagine if I'm in your shoes, there's some part, well, you know, the writing's pretty good. Yeah. But then there's good. this other part where, like, there's this massive responsibility. Is it take off pressure? Does it add pressure? Is it both? Oh, I don't feel that. I mean, everybody has done all kinds of Shakespeare's all over the world. And all of my Shakespeare's I did in the theater first. So Dream was extremely successful in the theater. You know, it was, it was the first show I did after Spider-Man. So it was a very nice thing to have it work and uh, have people be joyous and about it. And then someone came along, a film producer who I was going to do a movie with. And he came to see, he was British. He came to see the production. He said, my God, here's the money. Go make it. Of course, he disappeared. I ended up having to pay for half of it. And, but I'm still happy that the movie got recorded. Um, but it, it was, uh, and we did it like a movie. I had Rodrigo Prieto shoot it. We, we had five days of single camera set up and then we did handheld and shot. I mean, five days we shot the real performance and then went in for a couple of days of treating it like a movie. So it went to Toronto Film Festival. It went around as a movie. And yet there's no distributor. It never got real distribution, nothing. I mean, you can get it somewhere. I don't even think you can find Titus. I tried to look the other day. I think you can buy it for $85 a DVD or a hundred. I mean, some astronomical, and I don't even know who gets that money, but I don't know. It's not playing, it's not streaming anywhere. Can't find it. Oh, I'm surprised. So when you, um, I think about, that moment in Bali. Mm. And for me, I feel like I'm present, I'm balanced, I'm alive in that moment. Do you, did you feel that way? And, 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 and how do you feel that way? Do you have practices that help you feel that way? How, how do you think about that? Yes, that, that experience with those men coming into that square, village square, and, and for me, who'd been in theater since I was eight or nine years old, now I'm 21 at that time, it was, it was that, what, as you said, the white light moment. It was the thing of understanding deeply what the origin of performance theater art is. And 
getting it on such a deep level that whenever I would get lost or frustrated and Spider-Man probably being the most prime example of that, I'm just go back to that moment, you know, and it gives me peace and it helps me to step outside. I think it's very critical to be able to step outside of your own culture. That's why I travel a lot. And that's why I feel it's comfortable telling a story in Mexico or Africa um, or Korea, as I do with across the universe, which was a little bit closer to home. Um, this, you know, the, the Lucy is based on, and Max or my sister, very loosely, very loosely. But I was the little girl who watched my parents go through the 60s and through the war and the LSD and the, you know, all of that. So I drew upon my experience, but that was many years after I'd spent a lot of time traveling and abroad. Um, the thing of getting that feeling that of that kind of, or, or those things happening, I don't know if I can sort of say, yes, this happened then, this happened, this happened. But I think when I'm at a very extraordinary moment in the midst with comrades, with collaborators, like with Elliot, you know, who I've lived with for 30 something odd years, happily unmarried, as, I, as we say, and we are long-term collaborators. When we're working, to, the other day, he did the score to The Glorious. He's done all the scores to my movies. And my favorite score of his for me is, he won the Academy Award for Frida, and I felt very proud of that, but my favorite score is Titus. I think it's extraordinary. But he finished the score to The Glorious. He, you know, there's nobody doing this anymore, so he paid for it, he put it out. He's got a, he's got a deal with iTunes and Apple, so you can buy it, it's there. He'll, 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 there's no money, there's no money on any of this stuff. But I listened to it with earbuds <clears throat> last week. And there was no picture, there was no dialogue, there was no script. And there's no songs because the songs weren't, they weren't his. So it's just 40 minutes of his score. And I broke down in tears at one of the cues. And I could hardly, I guess I knew what it was referring to. You know, I knew where it was because, you know, I spent so much time with him putting it to the picture, but listening to what he did as a composer, I mean, it makes me cry right now. Listening to how he interpreted the scene, Leo's death, and that all those girls on the bus, I, I got what film, what music, not film, what music does in a way that is the most powerful thing I've ever felt. And then the next cue right after it was called Bella's Hat. And it's the, feels like period music because it is the seventies or eighties and they're canvassing in the streets of New York. And I jumped out of my chair and started to dance. There's nobody here, he's still sleeping, he works all night. And, and, and it jolted me and it wasn't something I hadn't heard before, but I understood what it is that this great artist had done. And that, I think what I'm trying to say is when I'm in the midst of working with great collaborators and we, and we know we've hit something, you know, like, those are the moments where you go, oh my God. I Like there's some moments in, because uh, I just did the glorious, you know, the scene where the little girl, the 12 year old is looking out her police car window and her neighborhood transforms into yeah. Hollywood. It took a lot with, with a visual effects house in Canada, boof, back and forth, back and forth to get what I saw in my head. But what I saw in my head was not exactly what they did, which is what is the joy they respond off of my direction and then they come up with something and then I go, yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that color. Go with that. No, no, don't. Why did you get rid of that? You know, we go back and forth with people whose faces I've never seen through this medium, you know, and back and forth. And then all of a sudden Fred Astaire is leaping off the, you know, off of the marquee and the way that they put it in. Yes, it came from me, the direction, but I didn't make it. I don't know how many artists did that, but what I thought, thought, thought was an extraordinary experience and so totally thrilling and joyful and sending off vibrations inside of me was that we somehow created this together, you know, um, this, this thing that, that you can't even write in a script. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I'm writing this script now and I know what I, I'm writing it totally and I'm going to direct it and I know what I'm seeing, 
but I'm, I also know that I don't know what I'm seeing. Meaning like I'm saying, that's computer. It's a futuristic thing. It's ancient and future. It's mythological, okay. it's future. And I'm going, why am I using the word computer? That's not what they're going to be in 20 years or 30 years. But I don't want to fill that in now because I'm looking for that companionship, that camaraderie with a great designer who's going to work with me like Elliot works with me. And that, that is the greatest thing about what I do because I'm not a solo book novelist. I would find that would be hard. Elliot writes scores by himself for concert music and stuff, but he also does theater and film and dance and opera. So when we do that, the collaboration, when minds get together and you create something that you couldn't do by yourself, that's a very, very thrilling um, experience. So I think over the years I've learned about that's the most important thing or is your collaborations and who you're working with, including producers, you know, including the money, the people who are there with you got to be on a page together and then not know necessarily where you're going to go. Meaning that when I say I'm going to take you to a place you didn't know you wanted to go, that's the same for me. Yeah. I, I want to feel like that. I don't want to know where I'm going. I don't want to know all of that. I want it to be a surprise. You know what I heard? Um, well, one is you said experience, and two is, and this is going to be a little self-serving, but we do this thing called the Neighborhood Project, and basically we have these subscribers, and once a month we send them film. It's about a half an hour of stuff, and then they talk. That's the whole idea. I just laid out the whole idea for you. Our our focus is meaning. You know, so a lot has changed from when you you came. Um, we did a trip this summer where we went down the, the, the Mississippi from top to bottom and we had conversations nightly on race, 20 people together. And we had a conversation and suffice it to say that the, the same beauty, I don't want to, I'm not trying to compare, but I do want to identify this unforeseeable truth, this unforeseeable experience would emerge every night in this beautiful way around this really hard thing. Sometimes it was accompanied with tears, sometimes yelling, sometimes both, sometimes hugs, um, always masks. It was like a real experience. It was so beautiful. And by the way, that goes back to that. Is it we were on a boat together? Not on a boat, but we, we drove from top to bottom. And we would, you know, we did two days in Minneapolis and every night we'd meet a mixed race group, group of people and we'd have these conversations. And, and this is what we do as an organization, but that's when I'm hearing you talk that, you know, I think conversation is so underrated. You know, it's such a... Well, that's again what is in the glory is you're talking about talking circles, basically. That's what yeah, you're, doing. Yeah, you're doing. Yeah. You're doing what she learned in India, which is grassroots yes, yes. change and it's talking circles. You know, you tell your stories and you find out you're not alone and you find out that there, there's commonalities and, and enormous change comes out of that because people need to know that they're not alone. That's... that's, uh, that's yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's Gloria. I mean, that's Gloria to a T. Yeah. I don't want to take more of your time, but I do. Um, I really appreciate you taking this time with us. Um, anyone who hasn't seen any of these, but the Gloria's is the newest and it's on Amazon. Yeah, it'd be great if more and more people. We, we were supposed to be on a bus, Gloria Stein and myself. I read this. Yeah. Yeah, in the swing states, um, showing the movie cross partisan lines. I mean, that would be the thing. You really. You just don't want to talk to the converted. You actually do. But I think we are. Because many people have said to me, when they, people I know, they say, my son didn't know who Gloria Steinem was. And he said to me the other night, now I know who she is. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's a good now I know who she is. I think so. I'm going to speak for my demo. If you're around my age and you're a man, you want to see this movie. I'm sure a lot of other demos want to see it too. But when I think of sort of the generation of my mother, you know, sort of the World War, World War II, right. um, little, little around Gloria's age, ballpark, um, it's such a, you know, it's a truth of a generation that, again, you, you didn't know you wanted to know, and it's a beautiful way to know, so. Well, great, you know. if you get that out to all the men, that's important. You have that kind of, you do that social media stuff. So you can send it. You can do that. <laughs> we'll do our best. We'll do, we'll do our okay. best. Well, Thanks thank for taking the time. Much. Yeah, yeah. It sounds good what you're doing. Really great. And it was great to see you again. <laughs>